Well, when you see the results, kind of comes through. Welcome everyone here and at home to the May 11th City Council work session. The uh, item that we're going to be talking about first today is the our street preservation project. <coughs> city Manager. Thanks, Mayor. I'll just turn over to our city engineer, Mark. Thank you, uh, Mayor Piercy and members of the council. So I'd like to start by um, recognizing the members of our street repair review panel that helped us in coming up with the list that you have before you today. So. Here today is uh, <laughs> Howie Bonnet, uh, Jan Janet Calvert, and John Borofsky. Anyone else has slipped in? And the other members include uh, <coughs> Jim Wilcox, Steve Lee, Gary Wildish, Paul Hobel, Dan Brown, Paul Adkins, Bob Klein, Clayton Walker, and Bruce Mulligan. Um, and a little bit later, I'll, I'll talk about the role of the Street Repair Review Panel in coming up with the list of projects uh, that are before you today. So, so we're really, today we're asking you to approve uh, additional street preservation projects to use with the anticipated bond proceeds after we complete the 32 projects that were listed in the in the bond measure. And after two years of construction and several bid openings this year, uh, we anticipate that we'll have approximately $10 million remaining after we complete those 32 streets. And the voter pamphlet identified the process to add additional streets, which was essentially getting the council approval to add any additional streets after the, after the 32 were complete. And the reason we're coming to you at this time is um, uh, assuming that you approve these additional streets, we'll begin work immediately uh, with the anticipation of going to construction on those additional streets in 2013. And it would help us uh, balance our workload, the workload of our our maintenance division that does a lot of uh, work on the stormwater and wastewater system in, in advance of our paving project <coughs> and the work of our, our partners, uh, Northwest Natural and EWEB, that do also do a lot of work on their utilities in advance of our paving project. So, so we're asking today so we can be prepared to go to construction in, in 2013 on these additional streets. So to, the process we used to identify the additional streets was we looked at the criteria in the voters pamphlet which included citizen input and the citizens saying we want to see reconstruction and we want to see it on the major streets. Um, the science of pavement management, which is a little counter to that and saying we should focus on overlay projects because that's where the most cost effective uh, uh, use of, of funds are on pavement preservation projects. And but also focusing on the arterial and collector street system because that's um, the most important to the mobility of the community. And then we also looked at uh, alternate modes. So we looked at what streets need work on, on access ramps, which streets have bike facilities, <coughs> which streets are transit routes. And then finally, the last criteria was geographic distribution so that the entire community benefits uh, from the bond measure and from the extra streets that we'd be able to, to do. And, we, and for that, we used the, the council wards uh, as a criteria for for geographic distribution. And so we came up with a group of, of projects that um, totaled 12.33 million, so it was a little more than the 10 million, and then scored those against the criteria that, we, that I just walked you through. <coughs> and then the, the role of the street repair review panel, we looked to that group because um, they represent a broad cross-section of the community. And if you remember the names that I, I read through, they, they represent uh, cyclists and um, uh, the commercial uh, people that are involved in commercial uh, businesses and, and geographically pretty well distributed throughout the community. So we felt we had a pretty good mix of people on that committee and that's also a group that's very interested in pavement preservation and very knowledgeable in pavement preservation. We've worked with that group for two years now in reviewing how we've expended bond proceeds and and you've heard their reports the last uh, two years on the, on the work that the staff has done. So we, we presented the, the group of projects and the criteria, and we separated it into two groups uh, of about eight million and four million. The idea is that, well, uh, we're pretty confident we're, we're gonna have 10 million remaining, but let's go a little shy and, and start with eight million that we start work immediately on, and if we continue to see the the extremely favorable bidding climate the rest of this year and beginning next year. Um, if we have the approval, then we'll add additional projects. 
so we presented that to the street repair review panel, and they had a very uh, lively and robust discussion on, on a whole variety of things, but they uh, aspects of pavement preservation, whether we should focus on overlay projects or whether we should focus on reconstruction projects, um, more focus on facilities that have or roads that have bike facilities or not. Uh, but then they came down on a, on a group of projects that um, include projects in all of the council wards, uh, total about uh, six and a half million. Um, so it gets us something that we can start work on immediately and coordinate with our our, our uh, utility partners on. And um, and then they wanted to come back and talk about not only the projects that um, we presented that they they didn't endorse, but a larger array of projects so they'd have more. Uh, to select from, and then they'd want to uh, they want to be able to have a discussion about um, pavement reconstruction versus pavement overlay projects, and they wanted to be able to tour a lot of these streets. So we so we're in the process of putting that uh, map together and those projects together, and we'll meet with the street repair review panel later that month to look at additional projects. Um, but at this time, we're asking the council to approve the list that's shown as attachment A. And um, uh, if you do that, then we'll begin to work on those and coordinate with our our, our partners. And I'd be happy to just a, a couple comments on the attachment B. I did uh, I did the math wrong, so the total on that is uh, <coughs> all the 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 numbers that add up uh, to something over five million. I think I have three point four. So the the individual project numbers are correct, but the total is wrong. We're all delighted that uh, we've been able to repair the amount of streets we've been able to repair and that we're <coughs> able to do some additional yes, ones is a great benefit to the um, to the community. And when I look at this list, uh, I'm on Fifth Avenue every day and I know what a riotous ride that is. Uh, for, <laughs> so appreciate seeing that on the list. I hear from people every day about 18th and and Roosevelt we've talked about many times, so it's all good to see these here. So um, thank you for that. Alan, you wanted to be first? Uh, a couple of questions, Mark. Thanks for doing this process. It looks really good to me. Um, the $10 million <coughs> exclusively came from the better bidding climate and cost climate. Well, yeah, a couple of things. It was uh, the the recession and the bidding climate. It was the 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 cost of money so we're not we're not ant anticipating paying the amount of interest we thought we were at the beginning I think that was a couple million and then we're also well two other things we're, we're using different paving techniques so if you remember last year out on 18th we used uh, really recycling some of the roadway in place so it reduced the number of trucks that took away old material and the trucks brought in new material so that was a, a cost savings on that pro on that project as well and then some of the streets, um, as bad as they were on the surface, um, our predecessors did a pretty good job in the design, and so they weren't the the failure didn't go all the way down uh, to the base course. So it, it didn't require as much work as we had thought, just from from the, being able to see what we could see on the surface. Okay. And so so the I like the list that uh, we're uh, going to approve, and I support that. The the not to endorse that the uh, <coughs> attachment B. Mm -hmm. The five million dollars worth of uh, projects. So, are those? You said uh, we still have three and a half million approximately left. Right. Are these ones on attachment B? Are they? Is it going to be coming out of that pool, or are these off the table? And there's going to be another. Pool? No, it'll be it'll these. Be these plus uh, of more. So it'll be. <coughs> Uh, these will be part of a larger pool of projects. Okay. So these are kind of <laughs> tier two, and <laughs> tier two will right. get bigger, right? To choose right. from. Okay. Exactly. Um, did did we end up buying the equipment to do that <coughs> road? Because we were using somebody else's, weren't we? No, we that's uh, that works all privately contracted. So there's okay, private. there's only uh, a few contractors. It's a pretty specialized piece of equipment, and it's a pretty right. expensive piece of equipment. So there's uh, a lot of that those contractors move around pretty much the Willamette Valley to do that type of work. Okay. Yeah, I saw that equipment because they did the street route in front of my <coughs> office, and uh, it was pretty amazing how fast it <laughs> just ground up the street, yeah. reconstituted it, and put it back down. It was amazing. Uh, it was very effective and efficient, and they had a street in like a day. Okay. Uh, so uh, and then s s so the the process of getting to the 
the next tier of you have a assess um, uh, estimate of when you'll try to do that, and we'll use the same process. Um, yeah, we'll use the uh, well. A little bit, be a little bit different. I think we'll use the same <coughs> criteria because that's con uh, the criteria really came from the voters pamphlet. Um, but we'll give the the street repair review channel panel the chance to a map to so they can see all of the streets um, and get a better feel for that. And then um, I haven't quite w walked through the steps on how we'll winnow that list down to uh, uh, something that that balances the money we we have available. Yeah, I. One of the things I pushed real hard for when we did the original bond was to get geographic distribution around. And when you looked at the map of all the roads that we were going to repair that people could vote on, that was the list. It was very geographically right. distributed. And I think that helped with the passage of the bond measure. And I think keeping to that is going to be very important in distributing that benefit around, around the city to all the different wards. Mm -hmm. George Pauling? Yeah, and speaking of the, the bond measure, when is it, uh, the current one, when is it uh, the final year on it? The, the final year of construction would be 2013. Um, but our hope is to, to get the 32 streets done in 2012 and the extra streets done in 2013. Okay, so then in 2013 we'll be, perceivably be going out and asking the voters <coughs> for another five-year bond. Is that the anticipation? <coughs> It could be 2013. I think that's a bigger discussion around our long-term financial. There may be some advantages in 2012, for example. Mm -hmm. so that'll be a, a part of the whole discussion. Okay. And the repair work that's going to get started here shortly on Coburg Road, that, is that part of the this bond money? Not the, the ones we're talking about today, but the yeah. overall bond? Yes. Yep. Okay. There's, yeah, there's two bond measure projects on Coburg Road, and then there's federal funding for a third section of Coburg Road. Okay, and then the, the part that we're talking about today is an additional. That's so right. The entire length of Coburg Road eventually will get done within the next two years. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then <clears throat> uh, this bond measure money. Uh, this isn't the type of money to use for <coughs> like the Sandy Drive project. It can't be used for that. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay, and then. Um, on attachment B, I noticed that you had Willa Kinsey from uh, Bogart Lane to Coburg Road, and in the AIS it says that the uh, um, street repair uh, review panel would like to get out and walk some of these streets. Is mm -hmm. that correct? Could you have them walk all the way to the dead end of Willa Kinsey? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's the east end. There's yeah. some, some pretty good holes where okay. it's the, the pavement yeah. is actually starting to do, I think it's called alligator. Yeah. It's starting to separate. So when you're looking at that in, in the future, I would suggest you take a little bit farther walk. <laughs> familiar with that stretch? Mike, Very familiar. <laughs> Mike you're next. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. <laughs> <All right. laughs> Uh, the theme for today, it seems, is uh, bonds. We've uh, we've asked the citizens of Eugene to pass, and and what we've done with the money in it. I just uh, I'm really happy that we put out a list and a specific map and said this is what we'll do, and we'll do it to the best of our, of our ability. If you'll trust us with the money, um, I think that you guys have done a fantastic job of doing exactly that, and then a little bit more and getting a little bit more for the money. Part of that's the financial climate and the bids that you've got in. <coughs> I know how hard you guys have worked, and, I, and I'd, I'm really happy to see us getting so far down this road, succeeding with these bond funds. So good job. Thank you. Um, get ready for the motion. I, only other comment I would make is I really want to give you a lot of praise for the innovations and mm -hmm. the, um, the kind of effort you've made to get more for, for the money that we have and also to do <coughs> practices that reduce our impact on the environment and climate change and all of that. So I just appreciate that whole, um, that whole effort very much and encourage us to keep on trying as, to do as much as we can in, in that way. So thank you very much. You want to put the motion up? Sure. I move to authorize the additional streets shown on attachment A the list of streets to be repaired with bond measure proceeds. Second. Moved and seconded. See, seeing no one in the queue, all those in favor, please indicate. <coughs> in favor, none in opposition, it passes. Thank you very much. Good job. Good job, Mark.
So next, uh, on our next item on our agenda is uh, the um, Ridgeline Park acquisitions. Good afternoon. My name is Eric Wold. I am the Natural Resources Manager in the Parks and Open Space Division. Good to see you all today. So the purpose of my talk today is to give you an overview of the accomplishments we've had uh, implementing two bond measures, really, in the, for the Ridgeline. Uh, the 1998 bond measure as well as the 2006 bond measure. I'll start out by giving you a little bit of context uh, of, of the Ridgeline. Then I'll give a summary of some of the vision and policy documents that pertain to it. Uh, I'll go over the accomplishments we've had and what we've actually acquired as well as some of the funding that goes along with that. I'll describe some of the capital improvements we've been able to uh, achieve in the last few years as well as summarize um, the annual O&M gap we have and the capital backlog we have, uh, and then wind up uh, with time for discussion. So to start out with, for context, when we talk about the Ridgeline area, we're really talking about a 20-mile corridor on the east side of Eugene uh, at around Lane Community College and winding through the South Hills all the way out towards Fern Ridge Reservoir. So just for context, I'll, I'll use the laser pointer here. A landmark that everybody knows here is Spencer Butte Park. Over here on the east, Lane Community College, Suzanne Arley Park, which you were all heavily involved with <laughs> earlier this, or at end of last year. And on the west side, we have Fern Ridge Reservoir. So you'll be seeing uh, some maps like this throughout the presentation today. <coughs> so something that we all recognize and appreciate about our community is Spencer Butte Park. That's the crown jewel of our system. Part of what makes our Ridgeline so special is that it's a scenic backdrop for the whole community. Uh, as well as because it has a lot of connectivity to it, it has a lot of benefits for both recreational purposes and for habitat purposes. If you ever get up on the ridge line, you get amazing views both to the west towards Fern Ridge Reservoir, and if you're at the top of Spencer Butte on really clear days, you can actually see all the way to the ocean. And to the east, you can see the Three Sisters. It's great and well known for its hiking, and it's actually been designated by the U.S. Department of Interior as a National Recreation Trail. And in addition to hiking, uh, some newer recreation activities like trail running have taken off and there's an annual event called the Ridgeline Ramble, which began I think in 2007 and it's happening uh, two weeks from today, or two weeks from last Saturday I think, this, this year. Uh, an activity that is available for part of the system is mountain biking. So in addition to all those recreational features, part of what makes the, our Ridgeline special are the habitats that exist there. Um, in this picture, exemplifies three of those really well. In the f foreground, we have prairie, which was formerly very common in the Willamette Valley and now is greatly reduced. As you go back, you see a few trees. Those are oak trees, uh, oak savanna. As you go higher up the Ridgeline, it turns into oak woodland, which is just a denser type of oak forest. And at the very top, you've got conifer forest. Part of why this is important is uh, in Oregon, these, the prairie, the oak savanna, and the oak woodland habitats are viewed as some of the highest conservation priorities in the state. And so funding organizations like the Oregon Watershed Enhancement Board and even federal funding agencies look to the Oregon Conservation Strategy to prioritize what they fund. Uh, and not only are these habitat types identified as high priorities, but specifically the Eugene Ridgeline is identified as a key area. In addition to those habitats, we've got headwater streams, which through protection we benefit the water quality of Eugene uh, and reduce some of the erosion issues and other things that come with, uh, as we develop out. And then there are just some amazingly beautiful animals up there, like uh, these birds and butterfly. And if you get into the, the darker coniferous forest, we have really amazing things like pileated woodpeckers and restaurant screech owls. So with that background, um, I'll go a little bit into the vision and policy documents that guide what we do in the Ridgeline. Beginning in 1998, the community passed uh, a bond measure worth over uh, $25 million. Of that money, $3.7 million was specifically targeted towards Ridgeline acquisition. Then in 2003, there was a regional effort. Uh, Eugene, Springfield, Willamette Lane, Lane County, uh, we're all involved in developing a Rivers to Ridges vision and action plan. And that was a really important regional vision 
and through that collaboration, we were able to identify connections that extend beyond just the city of Eugene to benefit um, recreational connectivity between the cities uh, and out towards some of the rural areas. Then in 2005, the Parks, Recreation, Open Space Comprehensive Plan was passed, and its companion, the, the Project and Priority Plan, <coughs> was adopted by the City Council. Both the Comprehensive Plan and the Project and Priority Plan had many goals or specific projects targeted towards the Ridgeline Trail expansion or Ridgeline Park expansion. Then in 2006, the, uh, another bond measure was passed and $5.75 million of that bond was directed towards the Ridgeline Park expansion. Then in 2008, again, this, is, this was a, a refinement of the Rivers to Ridges plan that was endorsed in 2003. Uh, that same partnership and even more partners joined to refine the Rivers to Ridges vision for the Ridgeline to be more geographically explicit and provide more detail about what we wanted to do in the Ridgeline. And City Council endorsed that in 2008, uh, as, as well as Lane County, Willamette Lane, uh, City of Springfield. So to achieve, well, uh, so here's the map from that Ridgeline Open Space Vision Plan in 2008. And again, I'll orient you a little bit with the, with the pointer. So Spencer Butte Park here, Lane Community College here. This, these light green shaded blocks represent significant habitat uh, that were identified for future conservation of some sort. Uh, and then over here, again in the west, we've got Fern Ridge Reservoir and Wild Everest Ridge is right there. And I'll jump the gun a little bit, but through the work of staff and council, really this whole area is now Suzanne Arley Park. So a major connection was made just in the last few months. So some of the themes of that Ridgeline vision are to protect scenic quality, to try to create connectivity, both within the Ridgeline as well as to other places. So ridge connectivity between the Ridgeline and neighborhoods, connectivity between the Ridgeline and other parks, and connectivity to the Amazon Creek Corridor, the West Eugene Wetlands, and all the way west to Fern Ridge. Additionally, uh, the goal was to try to enhance recreation and education opportunities in the Ridgeline, to protect and restore habitat, uh, protect and enhance rivers, waterways, and wetlands, maintain public safety, and to base uh, all of this on voluntary participation. And in the terms of acquisition, that means working with willing sellers. To achieve all that, we've really benefited from a partnership, which we call the Rivers to Ridges Partnership. Some of you in the past may have heard of the West Eugene Wetlands Partnership. That group has re-identified itself uh, as the Rivers to Ridges Partnership uh, to embrace that broader vision beyond West Eugene that we all have uh, mutual goals around. So these nine organizations are the official partners in the Rivers to Ridges Partnership. And we've benefited greatly by working together with them now over, um, over a 15-year period of time. So in terms of acquisition funding, in addition to the bond measure funding, we've actively sought other funds to complement that bond funding. And United Front has uh, been one way that we've done that. Uh, for many years, United Front has had Ridgeline Park acquisition funding uh, as a priority. In addition, we've submitted multiple grant applications to state and federal agencies, and we've had a lot of landowner donations. So in summary, um, here's an outline of some of the funding sources. Since 98, about 16 and a half million has been spent on Ridgeline acquisition. Of that, uh, about over 11 and a half has been from local sources. State of Oregon has contributed three quarters of a million. We have 1.9 million from various federal sources. And, and this is a very conservative estimate, 2.2 million in private donations. Um, that number uh, in actuality is probably larger. It's sometimes hard to categorize all the different ways that people donate land or reduce the sale price um, to make a deal happen. But all of that uh, really is a credit to all the partnerships and collaboration that we've had with other organizations and we've really tried to leverage uh, our local funds with, with other funding sources. So before the 98 bond measure was passed, this is what the Ridgeline Park system looked like. Um, there you see Spencer Butte down here in the middle, and both east and west of there, there was some land as well as, of course, Hendricks Park. Since then, 
we've made substantial additions to that. Um, here we see Suzanne Arley Park, which makes that Im very important connection all the way over towards I-5. We filled <laughs> in some additional lands here between Spencer Butte and Mount Baldy. Uh, this whole western side, Wild Everest Ridge, Murray Hill, Quarry Lane, all new. So I'm going to flash back and forth a couple times just so you can see that again. 97, current. 97, current. What's the pending acquisition? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to talk more about this one in just a second. That is a pending acquisition, which I'll go into more detail. And if you saw the Register Guard article today, it was primarily focused on that. So if you look at acres, uh, in 97, we had over 800 acres. And if you include that pending acquisition, uh, we have over 2,100 acres today. So that's a 250% growth in acres over that time. So pending acquisition. Um, this is 193 acres. Uh, it's called the South Eugene Meadows LLC property. We've actually been working on this parcel for 10 years. And back in 2002, we actually had funding, uh, the whole funding package in place with the Forest Legacy Program. And some of you uh, may remember the story of how the state of Oregon legislature, the, the e-board, uh, when the full legislature was out of session, uh, turned back a lot of federal money from for all sorts of programs, including uh, Forest Legacy, but included social programs and lots of things. Um, and so the, that funding went away. Um, the city and, uh, and many other organizations lobbied the legislature to reverse their decision on, on, re on that funding source. And so now uh, that is an eligible funding source for us again. Uh, this specific site has been a United Front priority since 2008. So every time United Front goes back to DC, <coughs> They've sought funding for this site. All along, our goal was to leverage the bond funds with state and federal money, because it's a large and expensive site, and we knew there wasn't enough bond measure money to pay for it. So we specifically sought to um, get state and federal monies as well. Part of why we thought we had a good chance of that was it has very high habitat quality. When I mentioned earlier in the presentation about the prairie habitats and the oak, savanna, oak woodland habitats, this site has a lot of that, and it's very attractive to um, funding organizations like OWEB, um, Forest Legacy, and turns out now the Bonneville Power Administration, which was a, has become our partner on this project. Um, in addition, it, f it fulfills a key recreation connection between Spencer Butte and Wild Iris Ridge. So here's an overview of the funding source for that pending acquisition. So at the top, we've got uh, over 700000 of bond measure money. OWEB uh, has uh, agreed to fund at 750000 The Bonneville Power Administration, through their Wildlife Mitigation Program, is bringing 886000 to the table. And then landowners donating 790000 So the total is a very ex expensive deal at $3.14 million, but only about 22% of that is coming from our local funds. We've leveraged the rest. Another really important part of this deal is that BPA is bringing to the table what they call stabilization funds. Um, and this is one of the only granting sources that we've come across so far for this type of work that actually grants stabilization funds, which is similar to O&M funds. Um, the idea here is that oftentimes when you acquire a site, there's some upfront work that needs to happen to get it in an easily maintainable state. and. Um, so when we brought to their attention the fact that we have a, an O&M gap already and that it's something that we would really like to see is some O&M money for it, they were able to come through with, with three years of O&M funding. So that 188 is in addition to the 886? Correct. It's in addition to the 886. And that's three years, that 188? That's total. So it's a third of that for each year. So it's, I think it's like 56000 per year or something like that. And the 325 per acre per year is the number that we uh, presented to council back in October. I think the, the amount of money that we think it costs to maintain an acre of Ridgeline property per year. So they, they basically met our request for that. So now that we have, once we get that, if once we close on that, we'll have over 2,000 acres of Ridgeline Park. Um, there are a variety of things that we would like to and need to do there. So we've been fortunate in the past, in the past several years, to do some good capital improvements, including renovating trails, 
We have about 12 miles of Ridgeline Trail right now, uh, and we've done various trail renovation projects to address erosion issues or trail degradation issues. We've also uh, added trailhead kiosks and signage so that people um, know where they're going when they're in the Ridgeline. Through a variety of projects, we've been able to improve habitat uh, for native plants and wildlife. And we've been able to reduce the risk of wild wildfire through redu reducing uh, hazardous fuels, uh, invasive species, uh, and overcrowded forests. This outlines some of the funding sources that we've been able to use. Again, just like with our acquisition, we've really benefited from our partnership with state and federal organizations. Um, and so we've gotten grants from Oregon Parks, from, from OWEB, uh, from federal sources like the BLM. Uh, we applied for and got several rounds of funding through the federal stimulus uh, bill. Uh, and we've also had private donations uh, in many volunteer work parties to help out. A6 is part of the general fund, uh, the city's general fund that's dedicated towards renovating existing general fund assets. And that's what we really use to leverage the other uh, servers match for the other, the other projects. So <laughs> even though we've been able to do some of those projects, we still have uh, existing needs out there. Um, back in October when Johnny Medlin presented to you in the budget committee, he mentioned uh, our O and M gap, which uh, we estimate now at about 1.7 million dollars annually for the entire parks and open space system, um, part of that is due to the large amount of ridgeline acreage that we have, and we also have a capital backlog uh, system wide. It's about a 15 million dollar backlog, and again, some of that is attributed to the ridgeline. Some of the types of problems we have are eroding or muddy trails and roads, invasive species like Scotch broom which will spread and spread if they're not addressed. And English ivy, same thing. And this is more of an O&M uh, issue where we have illicit camps and dumping that if not monitored uh, can grow and pose health is issues for the community. Uh, in spite of those issues, uh, Ridgeline Park continues to get increasing use and support from the community. Um, Mountain bikers, for example, have expressed their desire to the council in the last few months about wanting more access. When we, when we constructed the ribbon trail with stimulus dollars uh, about a year ago, um, the mountain bike community was very eager to use that trail. Uh, and uh, it's currently not designated for mountain biking, and they requested access to that as well as to more of the park system. We continue to have hikers and trail runners using the system every day. Uh, Eugene is famous for having nature observers of all types, so people are bird watching and butterfly watching and looking at plants. We've also, uh, over the last year, seen the, the rise of a friends group called Friends of the Ridgeline. This is actually a, really a subgroup of the Eugene Parks Foundation that's focused on the Ridgeline. And this last, well, about two or three weeks ago, they sponsored their first ever Ridgeline Day, which was a great success. Um, they had people come out to do work parties to maintain our trails, to remove invasive species, as well as uh, just go on hikes to appreciate uh, the nature or the, or the views that we have in the ridgeline. So going back to our vision map, this is what was produced in 2008. And again, I'll highlight these things that were identified for trail connections as well as habitat protection. So trail connection going this way, habitat protection. And with the actions of council and staff on Ridgeline or on Suzanne Arley Park, we've made that happen. And now with this pending acquisition, we're going to be able to extend the trail as well as protect habitat in that direction. So in summary, we've made tremendous progress in, in the last 14 years with the support of the community uh, as well as our ability to, to leverage grants. Uh, and because of that, we have an increasingly connected Ridgeline Park that benefits both people and wildlife in the, in the area. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions or listen to discussion. So I just want to say this is a very impressive story. And um, 
I uh, want to express, I think, on behalf of all of us, actually, uh, a lot of appreciation to the work that staff has done, a lot of appreciation to the public for their support, and a lot of appreciation, especially to all those partners, that, uh, the volunteers and those who have made those donations possible. Uh, it's an amazing amount of, of effort coming together. Even getting that O&M stuff is, is, is uh, really amazing. And um, the part that I don't see here that I'm actually kind of interested in, and I don't know how you would figure it out, but I think there must be some really good economic benefit to our community from having this attribute here that people come to and want to utilize. And it would be interesting to, to think about it in in that term because I think, you know, what we call, we are, our thing is being a great city for the arts and outdoors and this is a key piece of that and if that attracts people to want to come to our community, uh, to want to work in our community. Um, just kind of thinking about it in that way maybe is another piece of the story. You, you take We do a good economic story about how we leverage uh, dollars and partners and all of that and <coughs> I just wonder if there's another piece to this about what, what it does for our, for our local economy in general and just sort of put that out to you to, to, uh, to think about in, in how we tell the story of Eugene. So um, I've got Betty and then George. Thank you. Um, first, this is really looking wonderful. Mm -hmm. Congratulations. Um, I would like to point out that this is, we're building on what people back in the Depression started where they had, they had the foresight to save some of the land and start the process. And so I think that's um, really great. Are there are there gaps in, I couldn't, I'm not too good a map reader. Are there still big gaps in the trail that need to be filled? There are, aren't there? Yeah, there's, there's actually two issues there. I'll, I'll go back here. So there are gaps in, in lands to the two most important ones are between this pending acquisition and Wild Everest Ridge. So to get from here to here, so that that's a future goal to make that connection. And then the next one would be from with the Willow Creek, basically about where Hynix is, mm -hmm. down towards West 11th. Mm -hmm. And that's an area that we've been working on um, for a while and have, haven't had success in, in getting there, but that those two are the key geographic areas to get more land. In terms of the trail connection, um, in some of these places we've been able to acquire the land, like both Suzanne Arley Park, this pending one, and Wild Irish Ridge. We actually haven't constructed trails there yet. Um, so we have the land to do that in the future, but um, there's currently no funding available to actually construct the trail. Now, what streets, the pending acquisition, what streets go? The that. two main streets on the east side here. This is Willamette Street at 52nd, and we oh. actually have a tr we have a trailhead there right now to sp to serve Spencer Butte. Yes, I've, no, I've walked from there. And then on the north side is Blanton. Uh huh. So this just extends the area that you can walk. Correct. The new acquisition well. Yep. <coughs> and it's. <coughs> Is there any plan to, or is, or does it exist, bike parking at West Amazon? That's one place that you can access the trail <coughs> without a car easily. As going up to 52nd Willamette on a bike is rather difficult. Uh, but is if there were bike parking, that's one place I know of where if there were bike parking, people could ride from any place, leave their bikes and access the trail there. Is, is there any bike parking there or plans for it? I actually don't think we have bicycle parking at any trailhead in the system, so that would be a good thing to, to think about adding. That's a good one because it is easy to get there by bike mm -hmm. <coughs> from any place you can right. go through Amazon. Um, yeah. <laughs> and another question, I think. Rattlesnakes. <laughs> it just came into my mind. Are there still rattlesnakes there? At Spencer Butte, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. There, every year we get two or three calls from people who see rattlesnakes at the, on the summit of Spencer Butte. Oh. They're reclusive, though. Yeah. They're, they're not seen very often, but two or three times a year. I know someone whose little boy was bitten by one up there, but it's, it's, rather, it's really beautiful, but it's rather <laughs> ominous when you enter it from the parking lot. It says, 
falling limbs, <laughs> rattlesnakes, <laughs> poison oak. <laughs> you think, oh. <laughs> right. Be a cougar or two. <laughs> and, UFOs. Uh, I'm glad to hear you are making uh, better signs to mark out where the trail is, aren't you? Yeah. I've been, I was lost up there once at 5 o'clock when the days were short. And it's um, and the mud, what are you doing about that? That the for summer. The muddy trails we've we've been steadily addressing those and that some of the capital improvement projects we've been doing both with stimulus funds mm -hmm. as well as with the A six funds are to address the existing trail system where we have issues like that. Um, that actually that muddy section I showed in that slide is one we've actually been able to address. Um, so we have a list of priority stretches of trail where we want to do um, renovation projects on the trail. And so we're we're slowly but surely working on that. The one this summer is going to be uh, on the Blanton Ridge section, so just going uh, near the 52nd and Willamette parking lot on an existing trail, we're going to try to address that there. There's a lot of vandalism for cars parked at the trailheads, right? I, do you have any ideas about that? That's a challenging issue for us at any of our remote sites. Um, we at the Spencer Butte main parking lot towards the top. We actually have digital motion act activated mm -hmm. video cameras to try to be able to capture images uh, if there is vandalism. Um, we've had limited success so far um, in using that successfully. Um, hopefully, it serves as a little bit of a deterrent, um, <coughs> but it's just very difficult to get enough imagery of a high enough quality to use it for prosecution purposes. I know the parking lot at um, Fox Hollow. You can see a lot of broken glass around it frequently. Yep. But anyway, it's it's all really wonderful. It's a great asset for the community. Thank you. George Poling, and then Pat, and then Mike, and then Allie. Eric, on, on this particular slide, you have up the, the gray shaded areas down toward the bottom of that. There's the, and then there's the ones. You said those were identified for future trail connection and habitat protection? The large blocks um, so I think you're talking about for example this here yeah, and, then and this over here yeah and then there's another smaller one up above yep. yeah so those represent high habitat quality areas uh, not necessarily trail connections and not necessarily for public ownership mm -hmm. so part of this vision was that um, a lot of the land may stay in private ownership and this is to identify where some of that high quality habitat is and maybe there's a there's a role to outreach with private citizens so that they can manage habitat if they choose to who made that determination that was based on input during the whole public process that went into this so there were public meetings throughout uh, the eugene springfield area and a lot of staff involvement from agencies from around the region okay. mm -hmm. and i don't know if you have this or maybe john you can help out with of the <coughs> Money that was identified in the bond measures for this type of uh, acquisition, how much is of that is left? So once we complete the Mizen acqui <coughs> spending acquisition, um, we will have spent the, the money identified for Ridgeline Park from the 2006 bond measure. Okay. All right. And then one last question. Other than the three-year BPA funding for the o and what kind of outside the box thinking has, has been going on? We continue to try to get grant money to do um, sort of ca capital like restoration projects, mm -hmm. and we think we can do that for some of these sites. Um, and we think we can, there's a possibility to get grant money for some of some trail work. Um, more of the routine on that money, like addressing illicit camps and dumping. <laughs> That's really not grant eligible type stuff. So, um, on those, we're just trying to be as efficient as we can given our current situation, um, and hope that maybe there's eventually a long-term solution that council and the community can can help with. Do you expect the backlog um, of the O and M projects to grow as rapidly as the backlog in our street repairs did? So system-wide, I would say that the backlog in the parks and open space system will continue to grow if it's not addressed. Um, the more uh, the assets don't have the adequate maintenance that they would need on an annual basis, eventually those turn into deferred, you know, deferred maintenance, and then that turns into a needed, you know, capital project down the road. Um, I would say yes. I think the 
part of it with any infrastructure. You have the same kind of curve that I know Kurt uses all the time on pavement maintenance. And as, the, as any asset just starts to get older, and you <coughs> reduce the total amount of maintenance, it starts to deteriorate at an increasing pace. So we would expect that with facilities. We'd expect that with roads. You'd expect that with sewer system. Then you'd expect that with parks infrastructure. So I'd say it's, a, it's an important issue, uh, and it's it's not it's not critical, but it's important, and that's partly why we're starting to have those conversations around all of our infrastructure. Thank you. Uh, before I call on Pat, I will just uh, I know this is on a much bigger scale, but I would just harken back to what we talked about yesterday about Aubrey Park and the, and the sort of uh, ownership that some volunteers are helping take over uh, maintenance and, and some heavy duty work in our mm -hmm. in in our park system and how we keep trying to build that kind of um, public investment in our parks and I know there's some things that they can't do but uh, and I know they take some oversight and some work with but still it's a great thing to have people willing to step up to that level um, Pat, you're next. And I'd like to take on to that, Mayor. Uh, Golden Garden Park has had extensive volunteer help, and the Irwin Parks out in West Virginia. So a lot of parks have that, uh, have the people who live there care about them and want to make them look good. Uh, I have a comment regarding the mayor's, mayor talked about the econo economic impact of uh, the parks. I just had a conversation with the developer yesterday who was talking about uh, why do people live in Eugene. You know, uh, we have tough time as far as jobs are concerned and the economy is difficult here but one of the reasons that people do choose to live in Eugene is exactly what you're talking about Mayor Percy that uh, we do have a beautiful surrounding environment and this does nothing but enhance that and uh, I'll join other councils in, in praise for the work that's gone on through the years and that continues to go on at a very high level and I'd like to point out West Eugene um, you know it, you think of the Ridgeline Park as being along the Ridgeline but you follow this green dotted line it goes right around Ward 8 goes right around Ward 6 and connects into uh, uh, into what is the Amazon bike trail and uh, and a comment on the Amazon diversion channel um, you notice there's a green strip that runs all the way out to all the way out to Fernridge Lake beyond the city limits well that's City Park uh, we own that and it's uh, it looks like it's future uh, soft surface shared use trail but you can ride a bike on it today it's uh, it's the uh, uh, Corps of Engineers levies along the A2 channel, and it's very, very usable. In fact, I would challenge anybody to argue with me that that little stretch between Green Hill Road and Fur Butte Road is about the prettiest place to ride a bike in Eugene. You have to climb over a fence to do it, and I don't know <laughs> how much you want to encourage that, but it really is beautiful out there. And to and take your fishing rod because uh, <laughs> the crop in there is in town. It's a uh, city land. It's not. A, uh, correct me. Is it trespassing? Am I? Am I no, wrong? No, it's city. It's, it's city park. <laughs> yeah, I don't go there really. One <laughs> <laughs> me. You know of people that might. <laughs> yeah. We actually recently put signs up so people knew it was city park land. Yeah. Yeah. I, I did notice that riding my bike or the new sign. <laughs> Maybe you should point out for Pat where the illegal places are. In the <laughs> yes. <laughs> Tell my <laughs> but, uh, to comment on, on Councilor Taylor's um, bike parking, those green gates are great to <laughs> train your bike up to. Uh, but you have to climb over them to do that. Um, <laughs> so uh, the only other thing I would say is, is uh, Councilor Taylor had, had suggested that there is a certain amount of, um, of uh, vandalism that happens with, with POPs there. And uh, we... Um, you know, we have one of the best wireless video companies in the world, I believe, right here in Eugene, in Feeny Wireless, and they provide, they have amazing technology that can help relatively inexpensively to, to, to uh, address that issue, and I, I know that you're in touch with that, and you know what's going on there. So thank you, Mayor, and thank you for your comments regarding the economic impact of the, of the trails. Thank you. Mike, you uh, Eric, uh, good work and really nice presentation too. That was really clear and detailed and, and well done. I, I really appreciated that. George spoke to a couple of my questions with regard to the 60,000 roughly uh, ongoing O&M after the third year. I just want to be clear. We, we don't have an identified source for that ongoing uh, new expense that we're adding with this. Correct. Correct. 
I, I am glad that we're making this purchase in this fashion. I'm exceptionally happy that we're able to do it by leveraging, you know, 25% local dollars to create something like this. I am concerned that we um, add this capital asset and give ourselves, uh, in, in doing so, give, I would not want to see us give ourselves um, further rationale or justification for wanting to create a new uh, a new tax or a new revenue stream now in order to try and serve that. So I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll make some hard decisions instead. Um, I, my other question about the remaining, I heard you say that we've now tapped out that 7.75 that was tasked to the acquire land for natural areas in the 06 we, bond. So two of that, two million of that 7.75 is for the Willamette River. Right. We have not spent that, but we've spent the 5.75 That was the, for the ridge 17s line. in the north part right there on the on the map. I remember that. Okay. Um, my other question is, I guess it might be for Johnny back here. Um, I, perhaps for you, I don't know. Um, of the remaining balance in that 06 bond, much like the street bond that we put out, we had a, a list of projects and the map of where those were. One of the other things that we identified there was the 10.5 million, a portion of which was for the Santa Clara Community Park that we've already talked about setting aside, but the other portion was for the 13 neighborhood parks that we were to have in that, uh, in several of which are in the northern part of our community. So I'm, I'm assuming then two things. One, that we still have those funds set aside to acquire those neighborhood parks, but I'd, I'd love to hear, maybe not if now, at some point, how we're doing on that. My understanding is we've only acquired one of those 13 in the, since the 06 bond. Am I correct with that? Johnny would be better. We do have the money, but Johnny would be better able to answer the specifics about that. Uh, specifically, the question, uh, uh, do we have the money for the Santa Clara Park? I don't know if that's part of your question. but it has I know we've set that aside. So I know that part. I figured I'll answer that. that yeah. It's still there. Yeah, good. good, good. Uh, <coughs> uh, the money we had for uh, community and neighborhood parks uh, we have expended money uh, at Amazon for expansion, which was in the bond. Uh, of the 13 parks, we have uh, one that has been done. And then the other, you may recall that uh, when you made the decisions on the Arley purchase, that there was a trade-off that uh, uh, the Arley purchase came from that category. So. That will impact our ability to uh, do the full 13. Of course, what we're finding is a very difficult time finding uh, flat land uh, in the areas that we need for uh, neighborhood parks. And so we're looking at actually buying uh, developed property in those areas and uh, uh, holding it to redevelop as parks that uh, even in the economic climate we have now, uh, there has not been much opportunity even to buy, uh, say, older homes that might uh, be on the market. So it's it's a strain to, to get the neighborhood parks. Are those 13 parks identified in our PROS project plan? Uh, they were. Uh, probably the best way Next to... I apologize. Them. My better question is, are we charging SDCs based on those being in the project plan? <laughs> They are in the project and priority plan uh, over the, the 20 year window to uh, make those acquisitions. So I would, I don't remember the exact methodology, but I would say yes. Okay, I would, I would then I guess just within my last few seconds say that as we work through Envision Eugene and we grow more densely, the need for those neighborhood parks, at least in, to my mind, becomes more pronounced, and it won't get easier to get that land. It'll get harder and more expensive, I think, as time goes on. I'm not an expert in it, but that would be my guess. So I don't know, maybe we can incentivize uh, uh, folks to <laughs> get that land squared away or, or something, but I, I hope we, we use that as our kind of next uh, area of focus with regard to these bond funds that are still left. For the initiatives that we do, that is our next priority. But uh, recalling that we're on a willing seller program, right. that uh, uh, finding people that want to sell within <coughs> the price range that fits the appraisals 
Uh, another thing that unfortunately we're finding in today's market uh, with the decrease in property values, uh, people who have an interest of uh, uh, liquidating their property often find that uh, the amount, uh, what the appraisal amount will do on it doesn't satisfy their interest. So we're finding that as a problem as well. It's a challenge. But it is one that is our highest priority for those funds that we have ourselves. We're still looking at other opportunities where grants and other leverage funds comes up. And I think we should be open to looking at those as they come, each for their own merit. But our initiative is on the neighborhood partners. Well, thank you for your hard work. Um, before I turn to Alan, I just wanted to make the comment that I recall the conversation that we had when we were discussing the Arley property and talking about how difficult it was to find those parks. And I agree with you, um, Mike, that I think it's important for us to look for and continue to try to find parks for those areas. But it hasn't been an easy thing um, to accomplish thus far. Alan? Yeah, Eric, nice presentation. Um, very good. I think it might be the most beautiful presentation. Ever. <laughs> uh, so nice job on that. Um, as as Betty said, we are kind of standing on the shoulders of those who came before us in 1938 when they voted to uh, to buy um, the park. It's going to be Park down there, uh, or Spencer View Park, sorry, uh, uh, acreage. Uh, unfortunately, the other half of that decision in 1938 is in grave danger, which was Civic Stadium. But so at least we're staying on the shoulders of half of them. Um, I think this is a real impressive story. I, I really love the the vision of this of this uh, <coughs> of the Ridgeline Trail and being able to walk from Hendricks Park or LCC all the way to Fern Ridge would be great. You have any sense of ballpark when we would be able to do that? <laughs> Crystal balling. Hold you to it, or Given, yeah, the, well. given the situation that we've just <laughs> talked about in terms of the capital backlog and not adding new assets until we can pay for them, hard to say. Yeah. But the I mean, great thing is that years. we've we've yeah. we've set the the framework to make it possible in the future. Yeah. Well, it does it does really enhance the livability of, of the of the, all of the citizens of Eugene and like Pat noticed, it goes through wards two, one, six, eight, and and, uh, and seven, I think. Uh, so it goes through almost all of the all of the city, and it is truly an asset of the city. Um, I really like the. Uh, yeah, it doesn't go through mine either. But, uh, that's a good point. I, I do like the new acquisition. I think that's a great. Um, what that the, the little funky extension that goes out. Mm -hmm. What is that? That's actually a right of way. So, so that's a right of way along. It's basically an extension of 50 sec 52nd Street and an extension of it. What's there now? Is that a road? It's a paved road for maybe half that distance, and then it's a dirt road for the remaining half. Oh, okay. So it'd be a connector. Part of it would be on a road. Right. Oh, okay. So, um, do you have a sense of the update, maybe Johnny and the Beverly property and that acquisition down there? Um, uh, and where we are on that? I think that the status of that is the similar to what we last talked to. It's been on hold. Uh, any prices that we have been interested in seeing the value to uh, has not been consistent with the prices that the property owner has uh, wanted for the property. Uh, to further complicate that, of course, now with the other things that we've done, uh, funding sources that we've had in place several years ago, uh, now have been exhausted for other purposes like this or the early or so if that property status did change, we recognize that the council has said in the past that they want us to keep looking at it. Uh, but if the status did change, we would have to look at uh, that price and putting together some kind of a funding package uh, uh, to move forward. Mm -hmm. That no change otherwise. Yeah. And maybe it could be some kind of uh, leveraging like we've done with this new acquisition, which is a really good piece of work. I guess the 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 takeaway one for me of all this um, is is pointing out the O and M deficit of one point five million dollars a year plus the capital backlog of fifteen million that's getting bigger and as John said you know it's not critical but it takes a long time to get 
the solutions in place by the and we have this very bad habit in the city of Eugene of doing nothing until it's critical and then it got a lot more expensive and if we were more proactive about it we would uh, it would be a lot less expensive and easier to deal with and you know case in point is our 200 million dollar uh, street backlog that we're whittling away at extremely slowly and it's getting um, worse over time um, and, and I think we do need to address that both of those issues those two things the issue of the O&M deficit for parks and maintenance and the uh, uh, um, <coughs> the capital that we need to be able to do the projects not only deal with the backlog but also develop the properties that we've been buying we bought all these properties but we can't do anything to them I mean uh, I think you said maybe three times during the presentation that we have uh, we have this land but it'll be a long time before we put a trail in because we just don't have the money you know we need to think about proactively about a, a levy a bond or some other kind of financing mechanism to be able to deal with those two issues <coughs> Chris you're next thanks um, I, I appreciate the notion about what is the economic aspect of this because for me quality of life and quality of livelihood have always been <coughs> connected concepts they are mutually supportive of each other um, and I'm also real aware of the notion that if you decide to take on an asset you really do have to think about how you're going to take care of that asset over the long term um, and with that said, each asset has a different, I think, pressure for that O&M obligation. If I accept a road, if I build a road, or I have a public building, the pressure to maintain it is very great. Um, if I accept a natural or an open space, I may not feel quite as much pressure uh, to preserve it or to maintain it. Um, as I might for a road. I mean, it's a little different standard. I, I, that's triage talking. It's not what I want to do. It's triage talk. But the point is, if if I pass on a piece of valuable property because I don't know how I'm going to take care of it right now, um, I may turn away an asset that would really mm -hmm. be valuable. I think that was part of the conversation around Suzanne Arley Park. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean we want to go forever without taking care of it. You don't just buy it and then just leave it parked in the garage and never drive it. That wouldn't be very valuable. Um, but I do think. If, I, if it's my everyday car, I do have to be very conscious that I have to change the oil and keep it maintained all the time. And when we talk about neighborhood parks, that is something. That's my everyday car. I'm driving that every day. And the obligation to keep it maintained uh, is much greater than another kind of, of park. So as we talk about acquiring neighborhood park land, that really is where that conversation mm -hmm. about, okay, how are you going to take care of that land, that's, that's, that's mown mm -hmm. grass, that's uh, turf, that's shelters, those are play structures. Uh, mm -hmm. That's stuff you got to keep up, as opposed to, as it showed us in the picture, it's muddy, it's eroded, it looks bad, but it's still a natural area, and I can live with that a little more easily than I can live with grass that doesn't get mowed or irrigated or um, a shelter that's not taken care of. Um, so with that said, I think we're trying to strike the right balance, and it's, a, and it's not an easy thing to do, and it's not really good for me to try to second-guess you on what that should be. Because um, I appreciate the work you've done so far, but we are very conscious of the fact there is always going to be an operational and a maintenance obligation to anything we take on. Um, and you seem to know that as well as we do, but we always remind ourselves it's important. Uh, you touched on a little bit, but I would add to that conversation that every time we take on something that has a public safety element that goes with it, too, that adds to our, mm -hmm. um, our capacity mm -hmm. around public safety that we have to sort of build into the picture of thinking about it. And part of that is that, um, you know, people who come in and damage property, but it's also the people who live out there and it's it's all of those things that, that create uh, costs and and safety <coughs> issues for us um, we're going to go to the next round and there's Betty and then Pat thank you um, Ellen's already touched on part of what I wanted to say the second round the, the Beverly property the headwaters and I the question is there any I know a lot of the bond money was for natural areas and not not necessarily specifically for the ridge line. Is there any of that natural area money left? There is approximately two million left oh. in the natural area account, but that was designated for Willamette River frontage. It was designated, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so we couldn't use that for the. And this is mm -hmm. this is a very important part of the whole thing: the the property that the headwaters that run right into the Amazon Creek, and. Uh, it was that is that a part of your plan or is anyone thinking about that now at the present time given the situation that Johnny just summarized with the status of 
those negotiations and um, as well as not having any funding in place right now um, that's not anything that we're actively working on unless something changes in that situation I think it's really important to keep that from being developed but um, is there any thought about restrooms for parts of this trail But I'm talking about the, I don't know what the word for it is, the natural kind, like they have on the island at Crater Lake. Uh-huh. Composting like a composting toilet, toilet or something like that? I guess, yeah. Mm -hmm. Latrine? The so only... They no. <laughs> not latrines. <laughs> <laughs> no, not latrines. That's the only place we have <laughs> any facilities right now uh, is at the, spen the main Spencer View parking lot where six months out of the year we have porta potties. Um, other than that, we do not have any... At, well, and also in West Eugene at Meadowlark Prairie Overlook, we we have porta potties as well. It's a little bit off the ridge line. Those aren't so nice. I was I was thinking more like a composting. Mm -hmm. But that I'd just like to suggest that would be a good idea. Yeah. And it might help to keep the place cleaner too, possibly. Um, as for I wanted to respond to what Mike said. I think we do need new revenue streams for the things that we really need. And the the whole reason we have government is because we can't do things for ourselves and we come together and have a government and we pool money to do the things that are needed for the whole society, not just for an individual. And if there isn't enough money to do the things that need to be done, we need to look for new revenue streams. Thank you. Pat, you're next. <coughs> uh, thank you, Mayor. Really, this is a, a slightly different subject. It's still parts, but I just want to remind everybody that tonight there is a uh, coinciding with the budget committee meeting there's a public hearing or p open house on the Bethel um, community park which uh, they're planning a um, facility out there or this in the early stages of a master plan um, so just remind people who may be listening that that is happening tonight 630 at Meadowview School and, uh, and I will actually be attending that so. skipping budget committee Thank you yes all right, and uh, I guess the only other comment I would make around this is that I think one of the nicest things about this, aside from all the wonderful natural attributes and so forth, is that, that it's a, something we share with um, the broader community, that we share with um, Springfield and County, and uh, I think that's a really, it's, it's a very positive thing that we're building together. That's a, uh, something we should all be proud of. So I appreciate that very, very much. With that, um, thank you so much, and uh, thank you. we all thank enjoyed you. it a great thank deal. You. Thank you. Okay, I think that, that ends our business for today. Thank you.